Well, hey, you guys, you know, first first service on the time change. Good job. Um, I've been fighting a cold for a week, so I'm just going to apologize if I cough or do anything disgusting up here. Um, I'll try not to. Uh, yeah, as Michael Frey, you know, we're talking about talking about Jesus today. Now, Jesus, I think this is without controversy. Jesus is the most important historical figure that's ever lived. His influence, how he shaped the culture, you know, the values. Uh, if you've read anything about ancient times, Roman culture, and then, and then especially Western civilization and what's followed after that, it is distinctly shaped by this person of Jesus. Not only do we, I mean, there's 2.3 billion people in this world that claim some allegiance to him today. 2.3 billion people around the globe out of 8 billion people. That's pretty impressive for a guy who lived 2,000 years ago. So the question is, who is Jesus? There's not a more important question than that. Even looking at his influence today, who is he? What's he like? What did he claim about himself? What does he teach? And us as Christians, this is, well, the defining belief for us of who Jesus is. So we've been going through this series called Firm Foundations. We've been looking at the essential beliefs about we as Christians, what we hold, and well, we've come now to Jesus. And we're going to spend a good amount of time on the person of Jesus. We're going to be, today we're looking at him as the son of God, having this divine nature. Next week we'll look at him as the son of man, how he is fully human, he associates with us in humanity. Then we're going to look at his atoning death, how it saved us from our sin. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll be looking at his victorious resurrection. So yeah, in some ways we're making some pretty big jump in the storyline of the Bible. If you were here last week, we looked at Genesis 3, okay, at the sin of humanity. Now we're jumping all the way to talk about Jesus in the New Testament. So yeah, it's, that's, a quite a, that's a quite a big jump. And this is not to say that the Old Testament or, you know, the, the middle part where we're jumping over has no importance. It has great importance for our faith. But of course, in a series like this, unless you all want to do this for, I don't know, 50 years, uh, we, we got to jump and we got to move to Jesus. Uh, the Old Testament, it paves the way for him. Jesus is the most climactic, most anticipated event in redemptive history. So redemptive history, it deals with history, but it's specific history. It's about the salvation of humanity. And Jesus is our Savior. He's our Savior. And so how the Old Testament and New Testament often work together in this is the Old Testament makes promises of which the New Testament fulfills. So the Old Testament, as we'll read even in Hebrews, it talks about God speaking through prophets. Well, what they're often looking for and looking toward is the day of Jesus Christ. That's what they're looking toward, which Jesus, of course, fulfills. Last week, we looked at that humanity fell into sin and that there are consequences and there are curses because of sin. We live in this fallen, broken, sick, sinful world, distorted by sin. And that was in Genesis 3, one of the most discouraging, dark chapters in the Bible. But in that chapter, there is this great ray of hope. Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he's speaking to the serpent, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So even in this chapter, which God is laying out the consequences of their actions and the, what is going to come, the distortion of sin, the fallenness of the world. And here he's talking about that from the seed of the woman, from a descendant of the woman, will come the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent, the one who tempted humanity to make that choice, to fall into sin. So therefore, there is great hope that someone from this line will reverse this curse that sin has brought through human 
rebellion. And so really one way of reading the Old Testament and reading the Bible is you're looking for that seed. So every prominent figure that comes on, you're like, is this the one? Is this the promised one who's going to crush the head of the serpent and reverse the curse? But really, if you take a look at the Old Testament, it's a, it's a large book of failure. Because character after character, and even the people of God of Israel overall, they just, at some very crucial points, show that they are infected by, as we talked about last week, that parasite called sin. And so they're not the Savior. And so we just keep waiting and hoping. And then prophets talk about, but there is one who's going to come and and fulfill those promises of God and reverse the curse and bring God's true justice in the world. And you see, when the Bible turns from that Old Testament, and then you'll see this page called the New Testament, and you turn that over and it's the first gospel is Matthew, you get hit with a bunch of names. And yeah, it's not enjoyable reading. It's names that are hard to pronounce for, for us. But it's important because what that does is it starts listing these names, people born of woman, and it gets to the final name, which, of course, the gospel is all about, the one born of Mary, whose name is Jesus, who is called the Christ. And you see, that's our Savior, and that's who we're looking at today in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. We're looking at the superiority of Christ, how he is described in such magnificent terms. He is not only born of woman, but he is the son of God. So our main point is that we believe that Jesus is the eternal son of God. And so we'll have this, uh, the verses behind me, but if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. reads this. It says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power, After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the first point is that the son is superior communication, and I'll just reread the little uh, part of it, verse 1 and part of 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so there's obviously a contrast being made here. There's been different modes of communication that we believe, this is great news, that God wants to communicate to humanity. He wants to reveal himself. He wants us to know him. And so that requires a God who speaks to us. And of course, we got this Bible here, right? Which a lot of this has these, what he calls the prophets. Now, these can be people like Moses, or we have the writing prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, other people like that. And that's how God chose to speak. And it was over many, many years and in different ways. But the one thing is that God is a God who keeps speaking to us. And then there's a contrast here, though, because in the New Testament, in these last days, he says, he has spoken to us by his son. And this is far superior than than what came before. And look, we know know about this, right? We we who live in this age of technology, we've seen advances in communication. So we understand when superior things come that the old, you know, it's not that they don't exist anymore, but they're not as important as what is new. Um, I'll I'll give you a great example. One is, and and I don't mean to make you feel old if you you know exactly what I'm talking about. But why? Remember when you had a pager? Did you, did you have a pager ever? Like back in the 80s, I think, 90s? Why does no one have pagers anymore? Does anyone have one? Besides, like, maybe it's in grandma's drawer or something, but junk drawer, you know, you don't have a pager anymore. It's because the invention of the cell phone, Right? 
I'll give you a, a great reason why pagers don't exist. Okay, so I was born six weeks early. So when my dad went to work that day on June 14th, 1990, he was not thinking his son was going to be born. So he goes to work. Well, my mom's water breaks. She's got to get a hold of him. Okay, so call his cell phone, text him, email him. Oh, wait, <laughs> those things don't exist in 1990. So, surprise, yeah, I was coming into the world. Well, she's got to get to a hospital. So she uses this thing called the pager, right? Which doesn't, it's not a text. It doesn't say, hey, emergency, call me. It just sends a callback number. So, okay, he knows if, by the way, you have to memorize numbers. So he has to know that that number is his wife's and that he needs to get to a phone and call her. But she could just be wanting to know, you know, do you like lasagna? Like, he's not expecting it's some emergency situation. So she starts calling to other places and tries to get a hold of him. And she's like, if he calls here, tell him, your son is going to be born today. Get to the hospital. So she can't drive herself. So luckily, we have a nice neighbor who's willing to drive her to the hospital. So I'm not born in the living room. And so she gets there. But again, he has to call. And he eventually gets to someone who says, hey, your wife's in the hospital having a baby. Go. And he, he does, I think, make it in time. Um, I don't remember that, but he claims he was there. We'll see. I don't know. I guess I have to believe him. But, but you know what would make that story a lot less dramatic? A cell phone. A cell phone would make that a lot less dramatic. Just call him. Hey, my water just broke. Okay, I'll be there. That's it. I mean, cell phones are far superior. And so when we get to, you know, yeah, God spoke in certain ways. He spoke to the Old Testament prophets. So he spoke through these mediators, these human mediators like you and me, right, sinful people. But now he's speaking through the most superior form of communication, which is God's eternal son, which is also, as we'll see, the exact nature of God. There is no greater form of communication. There is, he's the final voice. We don't need another prophet. We don't need some later prophets. We have Jesus's word. He is God himself. He is the final and most superior form of God's communication. And there's two, there's two ways he is. One is we're talking about superior time. Okay. So we talked about in the Old Testament it being about promises and the New Testament being about fulfillment. Well, Jesus is speaking from the time of fulfillment. So everything before prophets is all setting up, is all looking toward. But Jesus now can look at it and say, this time has come. It is fulfilled. So we see that here. It says, long ago, many times, many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, so this is kind of the way the Bible writers view time. So there's this time of the fall of man, right? The curse that comes from that. And then there are rebellious nations. There's false worship. There's injustice. There's sin of distortion in many different kinds of ways. But the hope of the prophets is that there would be this day. It's called the day of the Lord, where God would make a really dramatic intervention in the history of humanity and that he would establish his justice through the reign of his king called the Messiah or the Christ. And that king would establish the true worship of the living God and that the nations, some of them at least, would actually become part of the people of God. Now, this is a grand generalization. So the time's kind of divided into two. There's a time of, you know, darkness, chaos, confusion, death, sin. And then there's a time of righteousness, of peace, goodness. And what predicates the turn of those times is God's coming as king, God's reign as king when he establishes that kingdom. So the climactic moment is when the king arrives on the scene, right? So if you're reading the Old Testament, you're tracking with what the promises are, who's coming. So when Jesus comes on the scene, okay, imagine all of that running in the background, okay? And he says this in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, so the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That he's like, all the promises, everything looking forward to this day, he's saying the day has come. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here because the king has arrived. Therefore, repent and believe in that good news that the kingdom of God has come in Jesus. So really what he's, what he's announcing is the end of that era and this beginning of a whole new era and our savior has come. And so Jesus is, is better communication because he's speaking from this era of fulfillment. We're not just looking to promises anymore, but actually fulfilled promises and that's far superior. And of course, the second thing, of course, is he's a superior person. I mean, who the messenger is, right? The Old Testament had prophets, humans, sinful humans like us. Now we have, through Jesus, God's eternal son. Obviously, he's the clearest and best communication of God. The prophet said, you know, this is what the Lord says. Jesus just speaks because that is the Lord speaking. So this point number two, as we get into it, is that the son is a superior person. And there's seven descriptors of the son. Now, seven is not a random number, certainly not in the way the Hebrews thought about things. Um, seven is not random because seven is a, is a number that has symbolism to it. It's a number that means uh, completion, fullness. Think about when God created the world. He created it in six days, right? And then on the seventh day, he rested over his works, completion. And he said that day is very good. And so with this, we have seven, seven-fold description of the Son, and so we're just going to, I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to count them for you. I know you all can count, but we'll just stick together here. He says, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So that's one. Through whom he also created the world. That's two. He is the radiance of the glory of God. That's three. The exact imprint of his nature is four. He upholds the universe by the word of his power is five. After making purifications for sins, that's six. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on seven, is that that's seven. And of course, even that, the last one, sitting down, completion, seven, the perfect number, right? So we're going to go through these just in little groups. So the first two talks about Jesus being the appointed heir of all things and through whom he also created the world. So this is a really dense little section here that he's trying to just, this is who the son of God is. This is really important for us. When we ask, remember that question we asked, who is Jesus? Well, there's not a denser, more, more rich description of who Jesus is than, than this. And this uh, pointed heir of all things is taken from Psalm chapter 2, where God elects his king. So I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Psalm 2. He says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. So again, here we even see in Psalm 2 is this promise of this great king, this king who's also called his son, who's going to have this inheritance of everything, of the nations. And Jesus, of course, doesn't just merely inherit He's also described as creator. Naturally, he inherits what is already his, as it says that through whom he created the world. That Jesus here, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, he's described as the creator God. That he is responsible for creation, which is God category. Only God, only the true God creates everything, heaven and earth. And yet Jesus is described as the one creating the heaven and the earth. Jesus, this guy, right, that we would call a Middle Eastern man who was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Galilee. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem, right? This guy who lived 2,000 years ago is yet, he is described as being the one who created 
everything. So clearly he has a pre-existence. So he's not just an ordinary human being born of woman. He is also eternal. And if he's called the son of God, he is the eternal son of God. As John, we talked about these a couple weeks ago, John 1, 3 said, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Or Colossians 1, 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And so, wow, Jesus is, is no ordinary human. He is amazing. He, is, he participates in the identity of this creator God. Jesus is God. And it only, from here on, it just gets even deeper into this, he is God. Let's look at three and four. The scriptures, it says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He's the radiance of the glory of God. Now, radiance and glory, a lot of association with light, right? So Psalm 104 will say, O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. So using that like as a, you know, simile, he's going to, put on a garment, and it's like light. God is brilliant. God shines with his holiness, his majesty. And that's the description given to Jesus. He has the same light. He's not just a reflection of the light of God. He is the light of God. As Jesus himself says, think about this. This is is not just some moral human philosopher, right? He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. If you're thinking of a human teacher, a religious figure, or something like that, you would say, you know, God's the light of the world. Follow him. Jesus is saying, directing it toward himself. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Who else can say that but God himself? And so that's because that's what Hebrews says. Jesus shares in his glory because Jesus has the same exact character and nature of God. It says exact imprint of his nature. Now this is taken from like coins or seals or stamps. If you think about a stamp, right? If you stamp a paper or something, it's supposed to make a replica of that, a copy that's supposed to look just like the original. And that's what Jesus is said to have. He has the identical nature, identical nature of God. So to see Jesus is to see the character of God. So when Philip says, Jesus, just show us the Father. And he says, Philip, if you've seen me, you have, you have seen the Father. He's not saying he's the same person of the Father, but he is saying that he is the exact character and nature of God. To see him is to see God. Five and six, uphold the universe by the word of his power, and then he makes purifications of sins. That this talks about his purpose. Now, Jesus didn't just create, but he also sustains. He keeps, it, he keeps it going. But he does also more than just keep it going. Uh, you know, how many of you guys juggle any, you know, I don't juggle anything well. I was going to like bring up, but it would just be a horrible, sad example. I can't, I would just be one. I could do one. Um, but juggling, you know, it seems to me like the purpose of juggling is just don't drop the balls. Uh, just keep them going. And that's sometimes how we might think of sustaining creation is, you know, just keep it going. Just keep it moving. But there's purpose to God plan, right? There's purpose to, in, there's intention to what he created. And we know that redemptive history has a finish line, has a goal. That's why it's called redemptive history. It's about salvation. God is moving history to an end, to a goal, which we'll get to in a few weeks down the road. We'll see where the end is as we look at Revelation 21. But God is moving everything. And I know it can feel like history is just random, or they say history repeats itself, or history has no, seemingly has no purpose, but there is a purpose to it. It's moving us toward 
God's finish line and God's goal. And we see that here is he makes purifications for sins. This is part of the goal. Because if we're going to join God in his kingdom, well, there's something that has to be done on our behalf because we have sin. And that needs to be, as he said, purification, has to be purified, has to be removed. We looked at this last week. Sin separates us from God. But if we're purified, if our sins are removed, that barrier is removed. And therefore, that ushers us into the presence of God. And then finally, the seventh one is he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is saying mission's accomplished. In his death and in his resurrection, the mission is accomplished. Sins have been removed. The relationship that has been broken has been restored. That we have salvation. That we are new creatures in Christ. And this also describes him sitting in power. He is reigning as king. And as Hebrew 2.8 says, at present though, we don't see everything in subjection. So I know it's like Jesus reigns as king, but like, but our world is still really thoroughly broken and evil. And sin is still distorting all of us and all these things. So what's doesn't seem like he's reigning as king. But at present, as Hebrews 2.8 says, we don't see everything in subjection, which means there's more to come. So the new, this new age, this new era that Jesus has started has begun, but it hasn't been completed. There's more to come. That When he, he returns, he's going to put a final end to all evil, and then his people who put their faith in him will be rescued and dwell in his eternal kingdom forever and ever. And that's still to come. But... The question that we started with was, who is Jesus? Well, Hebrews 1 here clearly lays out that he is our creator, he is our redeemer, and he is fully God. Jesus is not only a superior person, he is worthy of our worship. And so point number three, our last and final point, is that Jesus is superior over all. And it makes mention of angels. And it's like, okay, so why angels? Well, angels are glorious creatures in themselves. So you might think, well, Jesus is just in that class. He's an exalted figure. He's a great angel or something. But no, he's not. He is the eternal son of God. But it's also misleading because the title son of God can and is used to refer to angels in the Bible. So if he's the son of God and angels are son of God, so aren't they just equal? No, that there is only one Eternal Son of God, capital S. And uh, the Bible says this, John 1, 14, about God only having one Son. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, the famous John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That these other sons, they might be, but they are creatures. But there is, this is no creation. Jesus is our creator. He is our redeemer. He is God. And so our belief about Jesus is crucial. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus deserves our worship. And so we're called Christians, not because we just follow you know, this guru guy or wise sage or he's our philosopher or he's, our, he's just our teacher. For Christians, he's our Lord and God. And because if he's human, if he's just like a Plato, a Socrates, Aristotle, whoever, you can reject what you don't like. I mean, you might like some of their stuff, but you don't have to take it all. And our culture tries to water Jesus down. Yeah, he's just some human philosopher. Yeah, he's got some actually some good bits of wisdom, but the stuff about him being God or his teaching on hell or sin or anything else that might feel uncomfortable, well, you don't have to take that. You can reject that. But if he's Lord, if he's God, you can't just pick and choose what you like from his teachings. His word is truth. And this all depends on, well, who you think Jesus is. Is he just some human philosopher guy, or is he the eternal son of God? And 
C.S. Lewis, he gets right to the heart of it. He taught this thing called the trilemma, which is you have three options. If Jesus taught and believed that he is God, then he is a, either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. It's a long quote, but it's important. So I'm going to read it all in its entirety here. C.S. Lewis says this. This is his trilemma. He says, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or a Lord. He is a liar if he claimed to be God but was not, and you should not follow liars Right? If he's a leader, a lunatic, he believed that he's God, but he wasn't. Well, he shouldn't cr follow a crazy person. Or he is Lord. He is exactly who he said he is, and therefore our response is to worship him. So who is Jesus? There's no question more important. And our answer is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the eternal son of God. Jesus is God. And therefore, our response is to fall down and worship him. And if you have not surrendered to Jesus, if you have not fallen down and worshiped him, and you'd like to do that today, we would love to pray with you. We're gonna have, I'm going to be up here. Other pastors and elders and their spouses will be up here. We'd love to pray for you as you surrender your life to the true Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ. And if you just want to pray about anything, again, we want to just always invite you to come and to pray about anything and everything in your life. We are here for all of us. And so let me, uh, let me close in prayer and we'll end with our closing song. Well, Lord, we, we worship you. We praise you. You are, you are God, Lord Jesus. And so we thank you. We thank you for your word, how it is clear. Even if our minds can't fully comprehend how you can be both God and man, we, we confess that you are God. And so, Lord, help us. Help us as people who believe you, who confess you as Lord, to live a life that honors you. Lord, may we be grateful that you are not only a Lord, but that you are a Lord who came and sacrificed and died for your people. Lord, may your heart of love and grace and mercy draw us to you, knowing that you are a good and gracious and loving Lord. Father, may our whole life be about worship of you. May you be the center of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.